Um, so thank you for the introduction. Yes, that's me. Um, it's worth having a look at the websites, uh, particularly if you look at the uh, Centre for Gender and Disaster website. Uh, it'll give you further links to the GRIP project and some very exciting things that are happening there. But also gdnonline.org, which will take you to the Gender and Disaster Network. You look at the resources there. We have been working a lot on some very interesting reference guides. So annotated bibliographies with lots of resources, lots of suggestions for you, lots of links. So any of you working on gender and disaster and conflict broadly, um, go there because it's a good place to start if you don't know the literature. So the starting point um, for this evening is the problem as, as I see it. Um, so the problem in humanitarianism often is this thing that's called the tyranny of the urgent. And Bridget Walker, um, a long time ago, 1996, um, discussed this in, um, in an interesting, uh, uh, well, it was a bridge report. So uh, a, a gender, um, gender series of gender documents that really paved the way for some of the thinking that, that's still going on now. And in fact, when she was talking about that in the 1990s, uh, we're still talking about it now. So the, the issue particularly is if you're working in a humanitarian setting, you are confronted by um, death, disease, um, injuries, uh, illness, a whole range of uh, factors that present to you this urge to act now act immediately, particularly when lives are at risk. And the pressure to respond in that way to the urgent can push everything else aside. And so for many people, um, if, you, if you say, well, where, where's the gender analysis in understanding what the problem is, they're probably, Quite often, and I've heard it myself, their first response is, look, we'll get to that. We'll get to that later. We're saving lives now. We have to bring food. We have to bring all the other um, relief and resources that people need in extremes of all sorts of kinds. So that sets up a bit of a problem for us because... If you don't start with the gender analysis, chances are you're going to get quite a long way into whatever intervention you're involved with before you realize, actually, I think we've made a mistake here. What we think we are bringing to people and bringing to all people is actually only going to some people. So a gender analysis is really a key starting point, but you don't just use it at the start, you use it all the way through. So this evening, I, I just want to sort of present some ideas really, and um, unpacking some of the, some of the terms that we're, we're using. So there's not a lot of facts in what I'm gonna be presenting. But those of you who are studying the BSc in Global Humanitarian Studies here at UCL, um, for this particular session, you were asked to have a look at chapter four of the Routledge Companion to Humanitarian Action. And chapter four is on gender analyses by Diane Mazurana and Keith Proctor. And I just wanted to read that first paragraph because I think that sets the scene. 
And in fact, the chapter will give you a lot of a lot of facts, a lot of legislation, but also a lot of argument, a lot of theorizing. So it's a very good um, resource to go to after I finish speaking. Gender and age matter when it comes to who dies, who is injured and how, who lives, who is affected and in what ways, and what their lives and livelihoods are like during and after crisis and disaster. Gender and generational analyses are therefore key analytical tools for informing humanitarian scholarship, policy and response. I think that's a good place to start. Um, key analytical tools, once you hear that phrase, people start to think of some kind of checklist, some kind of you know, a guidance, tell me what to do. That's the, the analytical tool part, but um, I want to put forward a, um, an argument really that without understanding the, the philosophical underpinnings of why we are doing that, why we need to have some kind of gender checklist, if you don't have the understanding beforehand, chances are you won't really get as much out of whatever kind of gender analysis tool you might use. And there are a lot out there. So my starting point um, is really about trying to understand who are those people that we, if we're humanitarian responders or uh, humanitarian researchers, or just humans caring for other humans, how are we characterizing those people in humanitarian contexts? And I think we need to unpack the meaning of gender because uh, it's, it's not just code for women uh, as it's often read. And it's a lot more complicated than that, really. And so we are moving into the realm of intersectionality. I'll talk about that as we go along. And yes, you know, you need the, the gender analysis tools, the checklists, the analytical frameworks, um, but you need to set that in this wider um, social context. So if you wanted to just find out what a gender analysis is, um, the key really is that it's, it's a systematic process. It's a systematic analysis. And for that, you really need at least sex disaggregated data and gendered information. If there's time at the end for questions and if um, just questions and comments, and if any of you would like to, uh, to respond, then maybe the questions around the difference between those terms, sex disaggregated uh, data and gendered information, um, it's worth thinking about the difference there, particularly between the two words sex and gender and linking that to the discussion that's coming really around intersectionality. So yes, it's a technical tool, but also this, it's a key component of a gender responsive philosophy. And for me, you've got to have the two things together. And in fact, you could have, you could use the gender tool um, and you would get some data but you get a lot more richness out of that and a, a lot better outcomes from that if you link it to a real understanding of why you're doing it in the first place. So yes, it's, a, it's, it's not gender equals women. However, 
as a historic and contemporary continuing um, marginalization of women broadly. And when I say that, that can include a whole uh, number of other characterizations within that. Uh, it can include also uh, sexual and gender minorities and identities. So thinking about unpacking that uh, gender meaning is important there. It's important to count women, yes, because uh, for many years they've not been counted and we just didn't know and we didn't have the data. And even now, we don't automatically have that data. So we're, we're sometimes faced with um, arguments against doing this kind of work on the, um, on the basis that a lot of the evidence we're putting forward is anecdotal. There's a bit here, there's a story there, there's a bit of research there, rather than, as it says right at the top there, systematic across the board. And um, with the current um, post-2015 global frameworks, and that could be the Sustainable Development Goals, it could also be the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, uh, a range of um, global level policy frameworks. And they are all stressing the need for um, usually sex disaggregated data by which they mean men and women. Um, it's in there, but the question is, is it being implemented? Is it being carried out? So um, the, the what of this continues with meanings of gender, meanings of intersectionality. So um, if I say the word gender to you, and usually I use uh, a Mentimeter um, process here to find out what people are thinking about this. I'm not doing that tonight, but... Um, Whatever's going on in your heads when I say gender, hold that thought. Uh, I mean, if you feel like shouting out now, anyone, gender, what are we talking about? Otherwise, we'll leave it till later. <laughs> but here's one I did earlier. Um, so asking this question in New Zealand, a couple of different um, places in New Zealand, um, a year or two ago, people, people gave this range. Now, I'm sorry, the screen is kind of washed out, so you can't see uh, a lot of the lighter colors, but you can see the ones that I've circled for sure. Uh, women, yes, uh, gender equals women, but you can see also by the fact that someone suggests, well, more than one, because it's written quite large. So a few, a few people have said it, hated. Um, it's a trigger word when you say gender to people. Uh, it's a trigger word uh, for a lot of opposition. Um, and a lot of people will dismiss it. And particularly in a global north de developing country context, where it's considered we've got gender sorted. We've got plenty of gender equality legislation. Uh, this is a problem for elsewhere. Well, if you look into the data, you find it's not. It's quite widespread. So um, in another part of New Zealand, they were coming up with these words and Binary, that, this takes us back to that sex gender difference. So the binary is um, reducing gender to male and female, uh, and it carries with it a lot of other um, suggestions actually. And masculine, uh, so questioning also, particularly masculinities and toxic masculinities 
as some of you might have heard of before. And that is actually quite a poisonous mixture when you mix it with a conflict or a disaster situation to have this kind of toxic masculinity, uh, which can in fact cause um, and has large numbers, large amounts of um, gender-based violence and well, yeah, a lot of other things as well. So maybe again at the end, if any of you would like to comment on or raise any questions around masculinities um, when we're thinking about gender and doing gender analyses. And then the last one um, of these that I just show you, um, this one was from Denmark. Um, people there were, were, this was a very academic situ um, situation. So they were talking about power and intersectionality. And if you talk about gender and gender analysis, you also have to consider power and the exercise of power who has what, who gets what, who didn't get, and why. Um, power and entitlement. So even with a word like gender, it has quite complicated meanings to people. And so you can't be sure actually that the person who's working alongside you is thinking about gender and doing a gender analysis in the same way as you. There is this tendency that we all have to universalize and to treat everybody um, in a quite simplistic way, but to treat people as if they are just like us. So if we're thinking then about people in humanitarian contexts, and I am focusing a lot on women, but not only, so, you know, even the words we use um, suggest something about the relationship we are thinking of with these people. Um, often they're just thought of in its blanket way of as victims or their beneficiaries. You know, we are providing them with relief goods, um, other materials. Um, maybe we're thinking of them in stereotypical ways. When you hear that word, um, man or woman, boy or girl, uh, older person, or all of those kind of uh, identity characteristics, quite often uh, a stereotype will pop into your head. And gender analysis is really about trying to get behind some of that and unpack some of that because people are very diverse. So um, if you're interested in Lego or experience Lego um, as kids or even now, <laughs> um, Lego issued um, a new set of these minifigures uh, under this heading of, you know, people are awesome. And um, this to me, once I saw this, I thought this, this actually looks like diversity to me. Because we're asked to be very inclusive and to consider diversity. And if you look at that, I'm wondering what you're seeing when you look at that. But this would be a typical example of diversity where you have one of this person, one of that person, one of this person, one of that person. So, you know, you need, you need men, you need women, you need old, you need young, you need uh, a, a range of um, racial and ethnic uh, backgrounds. You need people with disabilities or not, uh, not, obvious disabilities and it's usually thought of as each one of these is carrying the load of that identity as if they didn't have another one well um, I decided when I I ordered one of these <laughs> packs to mix it up a bit and for me 
this much is getting towards a better representation of intersectionality because people have, they carry multiple identities and which identity is the important one at the time? And if you were to go on and develop a career in the humanitarian world and having to um, work with people across this very diverse range, you know, how are you thinking of them? And are you just putting them into a particular box? We'll have one of those, we'll have one of those, we'll have one of those. But um, intersectionality, like a lot of these things, is a bit more complicated than that. It's not just, it doesn't just mean the same thing as complexity. Um, so this is Patricia Hill Collins and uh, Surma Bilge in their um, Polity Press book, Intersectionality. When it comes to social inequality, people's lives and the organization of power in a given society are better understood as being shaped not by a single axis of social division, be it race or gender or class, but by many axes that work together and influence each other. And it's the way they intersect in different contexts that is uh, really the revealing thing about how power operates and how some people will be disadvantaged and others advantaged by this. Um, Kimberly Crenshaw is, uh, is the person who, who uh, coined the, the word intersectionality. And it's worth having a look online if you haven't seen it before. There's, there's lots of stuff of um, Kimberly Crenshaw's online videos, TED Talks, and she really explains it really well um, and quite movingly as well, particularly this intersection of gender and race in uh, a Black American context. Intersectionality is a lens through which you can see where power comes and collides where it interlocks and intersects. Intersectionality can, can get used as a blanket term to mean, well, it's complicated. Sometimes, she says, it's complicated is an excuse not to do anything. So this is a real challenge for us, actually, how to deal with this complexity that we're talking about and not feel overwhelmed by it and, uh, and avoid it, in fact, which is, um, which is what a lot of people can do. So how we see people can limit our expectations and their opportunities. So in disasters, which is where I uh, spend most of my research time. If you don't really know what's going on, then um, you can place people at greater risk. Maybe we don't understand um, why they may not want to evacuate when we tell them it's important that you evacuate um, or go to shelters. Um, I'm, think about that for a minute, because um, I don't know if you've um, if you thought about that before, because it, it seems obvious if there's a cyclone coming and there is a cy uh, cyclone shelter, why would you not go to a cyclone shelter? Think, think about that one. Maybe you've already come across that in your reading, but have a look at particularly the work of the um, cyclone preparedness um, program in Bangladesh and the developments that have um, happened throughout that program's life. Other things as well, of course, but going to shelter um, is not necessarily um, the answer for many people. 
not if going to the shelter means you face um, shame and dishonor because you are now um, placed in close proximity to men from outside your family, outside of your uh, community group, uh, or even outside your, your own culture. And humanitarianism is a very international affair. So um, it's common for those involved in humanitarian response to come from a different cultural context to those they are um, trying to serve. So you, you really need that cultural competence, that cultural awareness in order to understand why don't people go to the shelter? Well, shelters have improved a lot over the years, but um, for many years and still in some locations, they are not very good places for women and girls. Um, you, you have to be crowded close together. Uh, the sanitation is minimal. Uh, it might it used to be traditionally a sort of a bucket in the corner for everyone to use. There's a whole range of, uh, of reasons why you would not want to go to one. And uh, as a parent, you might not want your uh, teenage daughter to go to one. But maybe if you go into humanitarian careers, you can be a part of that movement to change those kinds of conditions, to consider when suddenly there is uh, an extreme event of some kind and you need to put up uh, latrines to think very carefully about what they look like, where they're sighted, uh, how far away are they from people, uh, is there lighting? Is it going to be safe for women and girls to use those latrines? Uh, who or what do the women and girls have to walk past in order to get to the latrine? You need to think about all of those things. And while you're thinking that, you are doing a gender analysis. You might not have a checklist. <laughs> at that point, but you, you have now, you know, you've understood the philosophy, you've understood the thinking behind it. You're asking the questions, and it's very much about asking the questions. And the problem is that we often think that everyone is just like us, and maybe they're not. Maybe they can't swim, maybe they can't climb, they can't see, they can't hear, they can't move or they can't understand in the same way that we can or we think they can. So uh, when we're bringing something to people in humanitarian contexts, um, it may be actually that um, the, the people receiving it are not seeing it in quite the same way. So, um, Thinking about all of those, you know, the technical approaches, how you might go about doing the, the gender analyses. I'm not going to go into all of those um, because that's in the suggested readings, etc. But thinking about this wider context. So, for example, you think um, you think uh, Bangladesh, and you think women. Are you thinking women engineers? Uh, working in the technology sectors? Or do you have another rather more stereotypical image in your mind? Because it limits um, your expectations of the people you're working with, and it therefore then limits their opportunities to benefit from what you might be able to bring. And so, um, this is an example. Um, you may have heard of the cholera crisis in Haiti in 2010, um, particularly after the um, earthquake there. 
And this, this comes from one of the uh, OCHA, one of the UN agencies. In Haiti, it was generally assumed that cholera affected women more than men, as women have the primary role of caregivers, putting them at greater exposure to possible infection. Therefore, women are more often targeted for information. However, following a survey at the end of the cholera epidemic in Haiti, it was found that of the 87 recorded cholera deaths, 67% were men. So it wasn't the 50-50 split or it wasn't 67% women, it was the men. If the program staff had analyzed their data during the epidemic, they could have reached out to the community to better understand why more men were affected. So th these are questions you have to ask each time because all of us go to these um, disaster situations carrying with us some stereotypes, but also we carry with us what we know happened in the last disaster we were working on. And sometimes that's fine, but sometimes it isn't because the circumstances, the context have changed. So you have to go into these situations and into your thinking with uh, a, a more of an open mind and quite um, a critical analytical approach. Um, so, you know, there's a toolkit. If you Google gender analysis toolkit or gender analysis um, uh, methods or all of those kinds of words, you'll see that there are masses out there and they're all similar in one level, but they're all responding to particular needs and context, depending on the agency that's doing it or the organization that's doing it but you'll find plenty of examples of how to do it. Um, so I won't go into a lot of detail, but you can see this is how OCHA are uh, characterizing it, examining the relationships among males and females of different ages, what are their different roles, who has power and who makes decisions. In a humanitarian setting, gender analysis provides the opportunity to analyze the impact of a humanitarian crisis on women, girls, boys, and men. So it's, it's quite simple at that level. It's thinking about those potential differences and not necessarily coming to it, thinking you have the answers to those differences. Because as you saw with that um, Haiti cholera example, it wasn't the women, it was the men that uh, were affected in larger numbers. So disasters don't always affect women more than men, although um, generally speaking, often they do. Uh, the, uh, there's plenty of data around on that. But you have to look at those other examples where um, more men are impacted or maybe some other social group. So um, you have to kind of pick these according to where you actually have the evidence, where you have some kind of sex disaggregated data. Um, and so you get the same kind of stories or the same examples coming up again and again. But there are examples out there. Uh, the Chicago heat wave in 1995, more men died, but not just any men, uh, older men and uh, men of African-American um, identity. So there are reasons for that. Um, Ilan Kelman um, and colleagues did work looking at data and found the, um, particularly the numbers of men and young men particularly who die in floods. Why might that be, you know, why? It, it 
it raises every time you get some data it raises a question you know why um and i started um early on talking about masculinity and masculinity can entrap boys and men in having to move through the world in particular ways that say i am a man you know i am masculine and that often involves risk taking and um a, a flood and a barrier that says floods don't cross in those kind of terms can just be a challenge for men and boys to say i wouldn't be a man if i gave up and turned around now i'm going to drive through it and so people die uh, in Hurricane Mitch in 1998, more men died carrying out risky actions because of their role as um, protector, um, savior, uh, going out and uh, cutting down trees in uh, hurricanes, doing, doing those kinds of risky activities puts them at greater risk. So you need to be thinking about who's affected and it might be another group. So um, there's been quite a lot of work come out of Japan showing the large numbers of elderly, particularly elderly women being more strongly affected and often uh, dying in larger numbers in earthquakes and other disasters in Japan. Um, how are they affected? You know, it, it should then start a train of thought that leads you through this gender analysis to go and try and find out the answers. Chances are you won't have the answer. Chances are you won't be able to pull the data off a shelf somewhere or off the internet. But talking with local people in their local context and trying to find out how um, that location works is a good start. And that's a gender analysis. But, you know, trying to find out who's got access to what, um, are there barriers to accessing services? If you expect everyone to all line up together to get relief goods in certain cultural contexts, only the men and the larger, more able-bodied boys will actually avail themselves of those goods. Uh, the women won't want to be mixing with them. And the younger boys will just get um, lost in the rush, really. So uh, who's getting access to what? And more positively, more constructively, uh, what skills and capacities are out there uh, that you can draw upon and that people themselves could draw upon because nobody actually likes charity and receiving charity and being on the receiving end of that. People want their dignity and they want to be able to uh, make their own way. So what skills, what capacities, what's already out there? Who owns what? Who's got the power? Power over or power to do something. Who gets what? Who doesn't? So these are the kinds of um, dynamics. And it's this wider socio-political context that we need to be aware of because it's going to affect um, the effectiveness, the efficiency of what you might be doing, or it might help you understand why what seemed like a, a well thought out plan didn't actually work out that way. So um, if you looked at that picture, for example, and did a gender analysis on it, without having access to any data or anything, 
you know, what, what are you thinking of? You, you, you've just landed, you're in a humanitarian role. And this is a picture of a situation and a group of people that you are actually there to help. But, you know, what is going through your head when you look at um, that group? Um, so out of that group, who, who does need what? And who's going to get any relief that's going? Um, and in thinking about that, how do you, as a humanitarian, avoid carrying with you your own beliefs, your own attitudes, um, your own cultural baggage? How do you then um, do your work without trampling all over other people's cultures and belief systems? Um, I'm not going to risk a video because <laughs> they always go wrong. Um, but those of you who are uh, not part of UCL students and staff and won't be able to get uh, easy access, won't be able to just click on the link. But this is, um, and you could look at actually any organization probably. This is a video from USAID, um, an office for foreign disaster assistance. It's only five, five and a half minutes, but um, it talks about what USAID does. And so uh, it's worth you having a look at that later. You could Google it and find it online on YouTube. But see how USAID presents itself as the benefactor um, but also see how in this five and a half minutes, you know, people are, the, the beneficiaries are viewed. Um, they are, they seem to me, um, victims. And um, USAID, and I could have, I, I, I'm not picking on USAID particularly. You could look at any of um, the, humanitarian organizations and how they project themselves and what they do. And um, think about how, if you were looking at how it was presenting itself, how a gender analysis might change some of the ways that you represented people in even a short promotional uh, piece like that. So we've actually come a long way in humanitarian work. Um, it was once just pretty much 100% dominated by a particular um, militaristic model. That's changing slowly um, so that you can, get a, you, can, you can get a lot more diversity in the people who engaged in humanitarian work and the people you as a humanitarian engage with and respect and invite also to be a part of the solution instead of just seeing them as part of the problem. So the take home message for me really is around thinking critically and um, don't expect to have all the answers, but go into a situation with a, an open mind and awareness that there are these kinds of um, power struggles out there um, and try and avoid being part of the problem yourself as a humanitarian. So there's a bunch of uh, references that you could um, look at. Uh, there are some of the sources that I was talking about. Thank you, everyone. Cool. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maury. Uh, to type some questions now. I just say for, for those of you who are, uh, who are watching this recorded, uh, you can do a few proper questions, for instance, into the discussion forum on, on Moodle. Uh, for those on the webinar, I may be there in a position to email in, in questions. 
uh, and thank you for moving that. Uh, do you have some questions uh, uh, from your audience and also maybe answering that uh, question about what we said there? <laughs> Be brave, someone. Make a comment. You don't have to, you can ask a question, you can make a comment. There's no right answers in this. There's just some answers. Yeah. You were saying it's uh, only girls and boys, but uh, is the kind of case called brigade and brigade? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gendered language, yes. Yeah, in Brazil, if, if, if you caught that. Um, in, when you say in Brazil, it's usually girls and boys. Um, do you mean gender equals girls and boys or men and women? No, or? I'm just saying that in Brazil, it's normally separated girls and boys, but nowadays and even before, it's now uh, there's a lot of... Like a, <laughs> a continuum or a spectrum, yeah. Spectrum yeah. Points in between girls and boys. Really. Yeah. yeah. I mean, some of us who work in this field um, think of ourselves as feminists. Uh, that's another word. I, I, I used to do a mentimeter <laughs> around the word feminist as well and get the same kind of spread and um, feminist is another trigger word um, but at the moment there's a lot of um, uh, critical gender um, approaches that have opened up a whole um, highly politically charged um, debate because in, in our world, in our um, humanitarian world, we are tending to think um, binary. We're thinking men, we're thinking women. Um, but there's, there, are, there is no longer a very simple um, division between sex equals men and women and gender equals, well, you know, a broader diversity. And the, um, the, the, uh, the political um, presence, let's say, of trans people now um, has been a bit of a wake up call, I think, because it, it presents, even in small numbers, it still presents humanitarians with a challenge. And um, there are examples of uh, trans women not being seen as women um, because they are maybe born and their sex identification was male. So you can have, um, you can have trans men who menstruate, for example. And in a humanitarian context, um, what do trans men do when they're menstruating? What toilets and latrines um, do they go in? Are they allowed in? Uh, there, are, there are complications that we have to be aware of because one of the primary aims of humanitarians, the primary aim, is do no harm. And you can do harm in different ways. So, being much more aware that uh, not everybody out there is just like you or your stereotypical uh, idea of what people are um, may mean you have to think a bit more laterally about what services you provide and for whom. And it shouldn't just come down to toilets and latrines, but on, quite honestly, it often does. It's a real kind of flashpoint in humanitarian context. Um, but, you know, we're creative people. We can, we can find solutions if we work with people to do that.
Yeah. <laughs> yeah good question um working <laughs> working in a patriarchal context and i have to say which of us doesn't work in a patriarchal context sorry um I think it comes back to that, that question I was asking about not trampling over people's own um, cultural beliefs and belief systems. But I think um, it depends on you and your personality and how you go about things. I, I always try and work with people uh, rather than you know hammering the point um, home. And so I think often when you explain to people, if you do it like this, more of your wives, mothers, sisters, daughters are going to die. We just need to change this and this. I, I mean, it, it's working at a very um, a simple level, uh, uh, addressing people, people's, um, particularly women's, practical needs rather than their real strategic gender interests. But nevertheless, it can make a difference to people if you just explain, because a lot of people just don't know that. They don't know that in certain situations uh, without thinking, because that's how it always is, women and girls are going to die. Alternatively, could be the men and the boys are going to die if we continue to expect, expect them to, to, uh, to put themselves at risk because it makes them more of a man. There's a question online. Oh, yes. Uh, Maureen, there's a comment and a question for you so, uh, by Virginie. So thank you, Maureen. Uh, has there been any progress in using gender analysis more systematically in the humanitarian sector? Yeah, thank you, um, Virginie, for that question. Uh, has there been any progress? I, I would say yes, because the humanitarian sector, and within that, I'm, I'm thinking very broadly, I'm thinking disasters, I'm thinking conflict. Uh, I'm thinking about the UN system, um, which is... Um, at that kind of top level of organization, uh, they have developed the cluster approach in an attempt to at least address some of these major issues, um, and particularly around gender. The UN tends to work through this notion of mainstreaming, and everyone says that they mainstream gender. We mainstream gender through all our policies and our processes and our practices, you know, it's always gender mainstream. But the problem with that is, um, if there isn't somebody also as a focal point who is really looking out for this, there is this kind of evaporation that happens. Um, a bit of a tick box exercise, you know, we tick the gender box, but they haven't gone back to those you know, really thinking about what's going on in this location uh, with these particular social groups, with this particular um, political structure that you're working in, in an extreme situation. So I'd say some progress, but mainstreaming, and it, it gets a bit of a bad press often now, uh, has some challenges to it, and we really need to rethink that one and um, start working a bit more in terms of real accountability um, as we go through. Just one more question. Okay, well, if that's it, well, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.